Good morning. Welcome to week six of American Literature uh, uh, 2130 here at Tennessee Tech fall semester uh, 2020. And the beat goes on, meaning that these weirdos that worked back 60 years ago are still with us, that books that your grandparents could have read when they were like 15 are still with us. And, you know, occasionally I'll have a uh, student who will say, oh, yeah, my parents were hippies. Um, in, in your case, uh, if your parents were, they were more like my generation, which was second generation, you know, hippies uh, from like the 80s uh, and not from the 60s. And so pretty much this movement of rebellion that starts in the 40s and even the 50s is grandparent and great grandparent level old. And it certainly would make you uncomfortable uh, to think uh, that your grandparents or great grandparents were reading these books or even more uh, crazy if they were participating in the insanity of the beat generation. Now, we're going to talk about the beat generation as a specific group of people that did specific things and wrote specific texts, but also as a movement that spun wide and large across the byways and the highways of the United States and into the college towns and into the deep urban uh, uh, ghettos and neighborhoods of uh, Bohemia, the counterculture uh, parts of a town uh, where all the weird coffee houses and clubs are located. Uh, we're, but we're also going to be talking about, so we're talking about the small group of people, the larger movement that it inspired, but we're also talking about these ideas as they sort of percolate in American tradition. And this is really the outlaw culture. And one of the uh, bridges that I could think about from the last unit was when uh, the civil rights movement, uh, people like John Lewis, who just passed away, and of course, MLK, but Lewis talked about getting in good trouble. So these are people that maybe uh, broke the law, but they did it on purpose in the movement. Well, now you're going to have people that broke other rules, other customs. They broke with customary morality and conformity, but they, were, they did it on purpose. But this brand of outlaw that we're going to be learning about in this unit um, trended more towards the proverbial bad boys of uh, American uh, culture. So out in one of my many uh, trips to the North Beach area of San Francisco, I, I regret that it's been so long since my last visit because the North Beach of San Francisco is one of the ground zeros for the beat movement. I uh, visited the Beat Museum, a fantastic place uh, adjacent to uh, the City Lights Bookstore, which is a institution run by one of the surviving beats, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, into his hundreds of years of age. Um, they had this sign here that they said, these are the most influential group of junkies, drunks, and criminals you'll ever meet. Now, in the tradition of teaching this in, in the college, there's a few things that you have to understand. And first of all, there's a big disclaimer that the text this week may be triggering. And if you read a part you don't like, you can either sort of just kind of hover over it and figure out where the discomfort lies, or you can, you know, just move by, skip that part, move by it quickly, try to try to forget that you saw that. So you're going to see in uh, my experience teaching in this in college, we're going to have a couple different traditional reactions to the beat movement. We're going to have this one reaction, which is going to be like, where have these people been all of my life? And yes, like your grandparents, reading on the road was a rite of passage. Knowing about Kerouac, going on a road trip was a sort of just a thing you had to do. If you were in college, you had to read the beats you had to read down the road. And your teacher, by the way, did not assign this book. Me assigning these books is almost a blasphemy unto itself because these texts originally existed far outside of the academy. And of course, now as time passes, the things that are weird and on the margins get brought into the mainstream and we bring them credibility. But originally, uh, the beats were, were not considered to be uh, even writers. Uh, Truman Capote said of Kerouac, that's not writing, that's typewriting. So uh, so we have some, some, some freaks from the far edge of society that have been brought into the mainstream of society. So the one reaction is the college student today who themselves are a beat, right? They have a beat sympathy and they will, they will go on a road trip and they'll write a blog about it and they'll tell me all about their adventures on the road. And of course, later in the semester, we'll be reading about Cheryl Strait and Chris McCandless, who were Gen X beats uh, of, a, of a variety in the 80s and 90s, but mostly the 1990s, uh, who took these road experiences uh, very, very, very seriously. So we're gonna go on the road uh, this week and we'll stay on the road. And I think there's a particular longing 
for the road that we have here during COVID-19 as anybody with me class, that during this time when it's so difficult to be outside and to be around other people, uh, that the yearning for the road trip is, is a particular yearning uh, that we have today. Now, I have been on some road trips few, far fewer than normal uh, this year, and I will go on one over, over fall break, but you have to wear the mask. You have to be very, very careful, and it's very, very scary, actually, uh, to do that. One of the places I'm trying to visit, some museum in uh, West Virginia might actually be closed, uh, still due uh, uh, to the pandemic. But the majority of students, and one of the reasons why I haven't taught these guys in a few semesters, and I'm really excited to get back into this, this is one of the first books the portable beat reader on my screen, uh, on my screen, not the projected screen, uh, is my copy from 2008 when I first started teaching this is all worn and marked up and falling apart at the seams. I've got, it's all taped up on the binding. Uh, you can see that there. Um, I've, I've taken a, a break from time to time from using the beats in the class. Well, no, like this one book I've been reading recently um, about uh, one musical side uh, trail one tributary, one sort of detour, uh, The Old Weird America by the rock critic Real Marcus. But it is that that this is old and that this is weird, that people t today seem to less attracted to the beats than a generation uh, before them. But one of the problems that I'll, I'll, I'll just lay it out right at the beginning, uh, because I want you all to come into this with an open mind, is that some students will read these texts and they will have out and out moral contempt for these texts. They will hate these texts. Um, uh, Ginsburg and Kerouac are, are already dead, and uh, and and students will will want to know exactly what quadrant of hell uh, they're re residing in, what flaming pit of damnation these two sorry souls uh, have been assigned to. And when they find out, you know that their their teacher's a you know a, a theologian. Why would a, a theology a uh, student be interested in such decrepit and depraved and almost demonic texts. These guys are outrageous, they're weird, they're stupid, and I don't understand what they're saying because they use language in a sophisticated way and I'm just going to rebel against the text entirely and wish I had not taken this class. Now, every semester I just beg of you to try to read these texts with an open mind and I hope maybe you all will, uh, will, will ruin my opinion that too many students today are too afraid of anything that is really super weird and different. So I hope you all will, will go bravely. You don't have to like it, but I want you to try to um, engage it open-mindedly. And maybe at the end of the unit, um, you, you, will, you will learn some things. Usually by the time we get to Diane Dupree, the students are relieved. Maybe her writing's a little bit more accessible, but there's a couple of moves uh, that she makes that when we get to Dupree, that maybe will be um, more friendly to you. Um, but give Kerouac a try. It's only, you know, 70 or so pages in the textbook of Kerouac we're going to read. Um, and then, of course, the extra, extra disclaimers uh, will come uh, for Ginsburg uh, uh, next week. But, but keeping in mind, uh, two generations ago, everybody your age was reading these books and they considered them to be um, sort of like, you know, words of gold, words of wisdom, words more valuable than anything that they could imagine because they were so raw and so interesting. And there's many, many themes about America that come out of these texts. And this is a particularly American unit. As a matter of fact, the next, uh, I'd say everything we've done this semester fits the theme, what is America? But in particular, uh, we're gonna see these guys in, uh, in their pursuit of America. Uh, maybe you read Walt Whitman. It used to be you had to read Walt Whitman in, in, in high school, great 19th century poet. But there's just this, this element of Whitman in everything that we're going to be looking at uh, this week, this idea of this expanded idea of America. America is a big and wide and crazy place. America that is, as Kerouac says in the quote on your screen, the holy contour of life. And this word, this incredibly sacred word is going to be reinterpreted by the beats in such a way that it's going to blow your mind, but it's also going to make you uncomfortable because is the sense that that everything has the potential at least to be sacred. And if everything has the potential to be sacred, why not make everything sacred? But I think it's the particulars, you know, uh, you know, the holy trinity of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's the particulars that they make sacred. And for some reason, we still bristle at sort of this idea that sexuality is holy or that 
or that um, mind altering experiences might have something uh, to teach us. And so that's the disclaimer. And, and for all obvious reasons, I'm not advocating any of this. I'm just kind of presenting this as this wild historical movement with so much interesting to do with language and literature that it changed America uh, uh, forever. And so much of what we've experienced in the last uh, 30 years and definitely in the 20 years of your life, you've grown up in the middle of a culture war and, and we're in the middle of a culture war. Just turn on the news and just understand some of the debates about you know, the Supreme Court um, a nominee and the Supreme Court justice that recently passed away in contrast, you know, those two very clearly, you'll see that there's a culture war going on in America. And many people believe that so much of the culture war began when there was a rebellion against sort of the success prosperity mythology of the 1950s. And so we're going to really dig into that. So we've been in the 60s. We're going to stay in the 60s and the 50s. Uh, for the next uh, uh, two weeks. So uh, one of the members of the beat movement who also wrote about the beat movement was John Clallan Holmes. And he basically argues that this changed everything. And again, it comes out of the context of the 1950s, which is the post-war period. So we have uh, the end of World War II and the prosperity and the success that kind of swept America in the 1950s. Now, of course, you probably are familiar with, you know, the whole kind of leave it to Beaver, James Dean, uh, you know, happy days uh, idea, American graffiti idea, you know, this is the Elvis and the beginning of rock and roll. This is the beginning of the suburb. Uh, this is the beginning of the teenager as a social contract construct, the teenager as a person with his or her own disposable income. Uh, and th this is the identity crisis of being young. Youth, youth culture is being born here. And so it, it's against the backdrop of, you know, the materialism and the conformity of uh, the 1950s. This is your, you know, track housing. This is your, uh, you know, white pit, picket fence. I love Lucy. Beginning of television, beginning of rock and roll. Uh, this is, you know, what you saw in Back to the Future when we went back uh, in time. It's a whole sort of vibe that these writers were coming into is where they sensed a, a sense of uh, claustrophobia, a, a sense of fear, a sense of uh, conformity, and where they was, there was a witch hunt uh, going on to, to find the, the evil you know, ideas that from Hollywood and the evil ideas, oh gosh, even from college uh, professors. As a matter of fact, the culture war today uh, that we're experiencing has been sort of amplified to resemble this in, in some very interesting ways. And so in a way, uh, the, the, the 2020 season that we're living in has some uh, connections. Take outside, of course, the pandemic. Uh, many of you wrote about the con comparison of civil rights today to 1965 in your blogs about MLK, which are all very, very interesting uh, uh, to read. Uh, so when this uh, culture war uh, began, uh, the Beats decided that there was a moment of decision. Now, uh, you can be on this side or on that side. And they, they defined uh, the division in America as whether you were going to be hip or square. You would be a rebel or one that conforms. You would be the uh, wild, wild west of American nightlife, or you would be stuck in your square cell, trapped in the totalitarian tissues of American society. That's your worker, uh, you know, your little cubby hole, your little workspace, your little six by six or four by four, your, your, you know, your desk, your uh, mailbox. Uh, it's your little. Uh, place where you go and plug in your computer and you sit at your desk all day. Uh, then it was a typewriter, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so you were sort of forced into the conformity. Maybe a few years ago, people watched the, I believe it was a Netflix series called Mad Men. Mad Men sort of flirted with how even the corporates of, of this really wanted to be hip. And that's the thing that's kind of funny if you watch a show uh, like Mad Men is that, he, and it's interesting that it's called Mad Men. We'll be talking about that in a moment. But, but that even the the people that were running the show really, you know, wanted to be a part of of this hip 
uh, rebellion. So they were even rebelling even in the places that were, you know, ostensibly there to shut down the um, rebellion. Another 19th century cat we're just going to throw in here, Hawthorne, uh, maybe again up there with Thoreau and Whitman and Fitzgerald, some of these greats maybe you encountered in high school. Um, of course, this class, we're not doing that sort of, you know, we only read the really old. You know, I'm sure some of you think 1950 is really, really old. It seems further and further away uh, to us, the farther away we get from it. But uh, in a maybe another iteration of American literature, it would only be texts you know, from the 19th century, early 20th century. So I feel that I feel that this is the beginning of modern, what our day's modern literature um, would be. But we haven't had, I don't know of a group today that's working. Maybe there's been some groups of poets and publishing houses, and they're so independent and they're so small that we haven't even heard of them. Probably, you know, there's a handful of, you know, independent uh, poets groups that function today uh, like this, but we've kind of lost our sight of, this idea of a literary generation or even um, a literary movement. And it says, uh, the best thing comes from the talent that are members of a group. Everyone works better when they have companions working along in the same line. And so what this idea of the literary generation really uh, brought to us uh, was the idea that we were in something together. And so these people were friends. And when they were friends, they read each other's papers. And so when I had a new paper that I wanted to see, I would show it to one of my colleagues and they, they have a new poem uh, that they've written and they would show it to me. And so we have this sort of big stew pot of ideas that's going around and we're sharing them with each other. So I'm putting out my ideas, you're putting out your ideas and we're working together as colleagues. And remember the big three, of course, we're only studying two of the big three and I've, I've displaced one of the big three and replace them with one of the leading women of the movement. Uh, there were also uh, a handful of African-Americans in the beat movement. Uh, and we'll talk about that too at, the, uh, at an interval later in the, in the unit. We've got several weeks now we're gonna spend on this textbook and on these writers. But the three main writers are Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and William Burroughs. And we're giving William Burroughs a uh, short side in this class for several different reasons uh, of which uh, maybe I will allude to sooner or later um, but just keeping in mind that they were a group of friends uh, that really, uh, really, really worked uh, together. Uh, and from the beats, you have the beat nicks. And you cannot, we can, but I advise against confusing the beats with the beat nicks. So the beats were the writers and the movement that formed this core, uh, that wrote the books and that promoted some of these ideas. But rather, the beat nicks were kind of a cliche fashion statement that spun off from the actual literary movement. And so the beatnik, uh, you can look it up. They talked really funny. You probably think I talk funny, but they talked really, really funny. Hey, man, you dig, you dig. Digging was a big part of being a beatnik. You dig, man, you dig. And it was, you know, wearing all black, smoking cigarettes, going to coffee houses, the, um, the beret, uh, the, bongo, the bongo drums. Hey, man, you dig. The folk music coffee house, the Bohemian folk music coffee house. Dig, man, can you dig what I'm saying? Man, there was some he hep cats down there at the cafe playing their drums, man. Play and there was some jazz happening. We'll talk about jazz in a moment. I neglected jazz during the music unit of two weeks ago. Uh, we'll get a little bit of jazz uh, treatment today. So it's believed by some that the beats spawned the beatniks and that the beatniks, uh, you know, were hip and the hip spawned the hippies and the hippies have spawned the hip hipsters of today. So you have this weird, you know, kind of continuum from 50s hip to, to 60s, you know, hippie to aughts, the early to early zeros, what we, what became known as a hipster. And we still have, you know, coffee houses. Uh, we have all of these places to gather. Poetry readings are still a thing. Live music and poetry readings are still a thing. And then from hippie, the rebellion against hippie, of course, being punk. And then when post-punk went to indie, and then there was, you know, ravers, goths, and burnouts. And, and I just threw jocks in there for fun. And I talk about that, you know, in, in a little bit. But but there were wars, you know, on campuses. And it was definitely, you know, oftentimes, you know, it was like, you know, the jocks and the cowboys and the greasers and the rednecks would be going against the hippies, the hipsters, the punks, you know, and so on. There were definitely divides in the culture war and clearly today where it's been so blown up on twitter we're seeing that in some of the urban uh conflagrations that we've seen the summers that we seem to have you know uh, a fashion 
statement for which side of the, you know, there's this, you know, what kinds of signs you're seeing and uh, slogans you're seeing. And so today, uh, the culture war is actually almost looks like, you know, maybe a civil war um, going on uh, in America right now. It's a very strange time. And, and this, there's a kind of an innocence to this. And it's not innocent. I mean, these guys were, did all kinds of crazy stuff that maybe we shouldn't, you know, condone. But there was a sense of innocence and adventure in the 50s and 60s that I don't, I don't see at least at the current in interval at this exact moment e existing. And maybe that's because all the, you know, all the festivals got canceled this summer. I mean, a couple of years ago, I think you probably could have gone just on festival circuit in America and you could have made an argument, you know, between, you know, uh, all the, you know, jam band hippie stuff, but also with all the electronica and all the dance music culture stuff. I mean, you probably could have gone and made uh, this lineage really vital even today, but this kind of part of the culture has been has been really shut down uh, because of the pandemic. So it's a very strange, uh, very, very, very strange time. And so one of the things about the Beat Generation is it's not accidental that they were called the Beat Generation. I mean, so Beat originally meant, you know, Beat. Like, man, I'm Beat. I'm, I'm Beat. I just spilled water on myself um, here. I'm getting so excited uh, giving this lecture. I got water on my phone. I think I will have a sip of this water. I'm up in I'm up in this place getting getting baptized. I'm so excited to be talking about this unit. So beat was tired, uh, uh, downbeat, exhausted, empty. Now, of course, beat could also uh, mean rhythm. Uh, 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 Holmes said, "A man is beat whenever he goes for broke and wagers the sum of his resources on a single number." So, so this idea of having nothing. And when you have nothing, you can have everything. When you have nothing is when you truly can have everything. And when you have everything, it is when you really have nothing. This is a paradox, and we're going to have to understand paradox, um, contradiction, opposites. These are things that we're going to have to be able to deal with with this unit is to try to entertain opposite ideas uh, at the same time. At least I want to encourage us all uh, to entertain uh, opposite ideas. Um, but Kerouac said, and I, it should have its own slide, and I, maybe it does later, but I don't think it does. Kerouac said that beat is beatitude. And I actually love that quote so much that I made a whole uh, book um, uh, about it. But of course, the beatitudes are in uh, the Bible in Matthew chapter 5. And that was this idea of, you know, blessed are the poor, the meek, and so on. Very, very interesting um, ideas here to understand just even just what the word uh, means. Uh, everything has, should have a birthday, and our, our birthday is coming up really soon. Um, I'm going to be 53. Shout out to all the Li Libras on the call. Libras are the best. Um, but my birthday is very close to the birthday of the Beat Generation, uh, which will be um, how many years old is that? Um, 65 years old. The Beat Generation will be 65 years old on October 7th. I can't, I can't add. Yeah, 65 years old. Uh, and there was a poetry reading at an uh, art gallery in San Francisco, uh, organized by Allen Ginsberg, that was the bringing together of the East Coast movement and the West Coast movement. And uh, it was emceed by a cat by the name of Kenneth Rexroth. Kerouac passed the hat and took up donations and went out and bought these jugs, these big giant glass jugs. This is before they had box wine. Uh, they had, they would buy wines by the jug. You know, people box wine, you know, he's very portable. You take the, the, the bag out of the box. Um, we were at Bonnaroo. Now, I don't drink. I'm, I've been sober 11 years, but my wife and I were at Bonnaroo a couple years ago, and these neighbor campers came up to us, and they said, hey, uh, would you like to slap the bag? And I had no idea what that meant, but that had to do with dr drinking, I guess, out of the bag that was in the box that was the box one. But before they had box one, they would buy these big jugs of cheap wine, big glass jugs. And so Kerouac went out and bought a bunch of these jugs of wine, uh, Kerouac uh, sadly uh, died of alcoholism at 47. Very sad story. Uh, uh, Jack Kerouac was definitely, you know, uh, afflicted uh, by the disease of addiction. Uh, but all these people were there, and they considered that to kind of be the beginning of, uh, of the Beat Generation. And, and it happened in the Bay Area, and it happened at uh, a poetry reading. Never been to California. I strongly recommend uh, checking out uh, the Bay Area. Very interesting part of American um, 
culture. And so one of the things that you have uh, in probably in the hippie movement as well, which this beat a subset of this class, we'll talk about hippie stuff a little bit. And we'll definitely talk about hippie stuff a little bit when we look at um, Cheryl Strayed's uh, book and even the Ecotopia book at the end of uh, uh, the semester. So my parents, I don't think were technically hippies, but I might have been conceived on the day of the great San Francisco love-in in January of uh, 67, being as I was born in October of 67. So I'm definitely born of the summer of love, and I've always been obsessed um, with the 60s. And I've noticed some students have parents that really brought them up in music. So I've had a lot of students over the years be obsessed with like the 80s, for example. So if you know people of your generation that are obsessed with like the 1980s or the 1990s, that would be like me being obsessed with like the 50s and 60s, right? Because it was like that that period of my parents and it was that period like right before um, I was born and the year that I was born as well. But one of the themes here is that they were very uh, inspired by black culture, but there was this element of them appropriating it. And, and today, uh, maybe as you've been brought up, you've, you've been exposed to this, the idea of cultural appropriation has gone sour and people don't really want to see so much of it. And, and there seems to be a, a need for uh, at least white musicians and artists and poets to take a step back and to look at their role in, in, in borrowing. But, but clearly jazz music, uh, improvisational jazz music and bebop jazz music in particular was the thing that drove the movement of the beat writers in part because they saw the way that a person played their horn, their saxophone, their trumpet, the way they played their instrument as a way of breathing, as a way of expanding the mind and the body and literally like imagining like a really long, deep breath, inhale, like in yoga, sometimes we count, you know, so long, long inhale and a long exhale, the extent of how long that breath could go became how long a sentence could be. And so we're going to see run on sentences as an art form. We're going to see really long lines of poetry as an art form. And so the long line of Ginsburg and the run on sentence of Kerouac are direct uh, exports from the jazz scene for which they were so inspired and so the movement of jazz inspired the writing of the beats and it stood for freedom both in the social regard because there seemed to be fewer rules and there seemed to be this kind of alternate reality that was happening in the clubs at night so there's this breaking down of barriers between black and white and between night and day and between freedom and conformity but then the actual music itself influenced the mood and the style of the writing. And I'll be sharing uh, with you at some point soon, very soon, a playlist of, of jazz inspired by at least the Kerouacian end of it. Uh, but these are some of the, the really important uh, jazz artists uh, that spoke to and inspired them in their work as beat writers, uh, including, uh, not limited to, Thelonious Monk, Miles Davis, Charles, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, and Charles Mingus. Uh, if you wanted to start somewhere, maybe A Love Supreme by John Coltrane. If you wanted to just take a brief introduction into this music, um, A Love Supreme uh, by John Coltrane might be uh, a good place to start. This is instrumental music. This is not um, music that's led by lyrics and song forms. Uh, they tend to be long, long kind of spacious. Good, uh, in my opinion, can be good study music, could be good music to get into a good groove when you're doing something else, when you want to have music in the background to help you focus uh, during uh, your multi-tasking. Uh, uh, tax I'm gonna talk, I, I was looking through these slides and, and they're about as beat as they get because I can't necessarily, I've used this slideshow in one form or fashion over the years, can't necessarily determine the uh, arc of my slides. And But we're gonna talk for a little while, I think, before I can get to the, details about Kerouac in just a few minutes and get you ready for the reading assignment for Wednesday when we'll be talking about Kerouac in more depth. Um, but to talk about this, uh, the spirituality of the beats a little bit. Um, and so so this uh, beat writer, a writer about the beats coined the, the three T's transgression, which means breaking the rules, transformation, which means uh, changing really the rules, uh, and, and transcendence, which means getting beyond the rules, right? So, so transgression to to break and to uh, get in trouble, maybe to uh, 
uh, go against, uh, transform to change, to move, to be transformed and transcend, to get beyond and past um, our limitations. Uh, so yeah, so uh, so this will take us, we talked a lot uh, in the end of the last unit about the influence of Christianity on the civil rights movement and on the music of the gospel and the blues. So what we're going to see here is the beginning of American spirituality being eclectic. So uh, there's a great argument in American studies about the constitutional uh, prescript against the creation of a state religion. So we do not live in what is called um, a theocracy. And without going off on too much of a tangent, there are people right today who wish we had one religion, one primary religion. Well, there's a lot of debate around the idea of how we arrived where we did, but clearly we have to, I think if we're being authentic and honest, just accept that religious diversity is this really important part of America. And, and it's not, it's not anti-religion and it's not pro one particular religion, but it's sort of a celebration of religious plurality. And so the beat movement was not alone. This was going on throughout the 20th century. It even started in the 19th century. But the beats really tapped into and celebrated an integrated religious movement that was eclectic and eccentric and drew upon different sources, even so as one would use a fancy word called uh, uh, syncretic. And, and this is not really a word that is very popular because it's used in the religious studies uh, discipline to be a negative usually. But what we have here, an interfaith usually responds to different faith leaders just getting together and having like a cup of coffee. So what we actually have here, class, and I've typed the term into uh, the chat window, is interspiritual. So these are actual practitioners of more than one religion simultaneously. And so what you have here is Judaism of Ginsburg's lineage, Catholicism of Kerouac's lineage, and the Buddhism that they were learning from the East, especially from one of their colleague writers by the name of Gary Snyder. And they were actually participating in, and then you add you know, drugs and alcohol and jazz to it, and they were actually participating in a new religious movement. This is the correct term uh, that they use uh, today to describe efforts like this. And I would say that the beat movement itself was a new uh, religious movement. I'm not sure if I'm t I'm, I can type and talk at the same time, but I'm gonna try, there we go, um, and chew gum and dance on one foot while I am at it. So um, one of the things that's really interesting though too is that the, one of the Buddhist ideals is to really get out of yourself and to get beyond words and thought and definitely to smash the ego and what's really interesting is if you, you spend any time, which I hope you will, these next couple of weeks with Kerouac and Ginsburg, is these guys are unbelievable egomaniacs. I mean, they're excessive egomaniacs. These guys are so full of themselves. And I guess maybe it is the egomaniac who needs an egoless religion. Uh, but these were people who were obsessed with the sound of their own voice, who uh, were in love with their own words. I mean, these guys were in love with themselves, for show. Sure. All right, so uh, beat is beatitude, a special spirituality, beautiful, egoless, religious, illuminated, every day and everywhere, or, or in uh, the words of, I think that's Ginsburg, transcendental, kissable, milk light of everlasting eternity, or might be Kerouac, uh, and, I, and I should have a, that footnoted, but that is a quote from one of the two of my top two, Kerouac and Ginsburg. Um, so Kerouac, um, his Catholicism never left him. And this is always makes people uncomfortable because it's like, if this guy was a Christian, why is he act the way he does? Hey, look, hey, look, like, let it go. Like, let's just be uncomfortable with the fact that he was a, a, a rebel who never abandoned his Catholicism and who adopted his Buddhism as seriously as he adopted his bottle, you know, uh, and he took the bottle very, very, very seriously. Uh, um, uh, some of the last uh, television episodes that I have where he's being uh, interviewed on TV before he passed away, he's like clearly, you know, 10 sheets to the wind, tore up from the floor up. I mean, drunk, drunk, drunk. Um, profoundly religious, though, this, uh, this Catholic minister referred to Kerouac as truly exalted by vision, searching for liberation, total 
liberation. He longed to fly out into everlasting space. Christ is joy, he said, not damnation. That's why he cursed the blanking Pharisees. Everywhere, everywhere, Pharisees. Now, the funny thing about it is, is it, no one would call themselves a Pharisee, but except Paul, uh, Apostle Paul did. Um, so here, a, a couple of beautiful images from the Beat Museum to, to really capture this inclusive and irreverent spirituality. This actual book, Jesus Was a Beatnik, one of my absolute favorites. And my whole book, I have a whole book, it's out, I guess, kind of out of print, but um, maybe I'll share a poem from it later, uh, called Beat is Beatitude. I think I probably will share a poem from it, maybe as early uh, as soon. Um, but Beat is Beatitude, uh, uh, Jesus Was a Beatnik, and then, of course, Buddha, uh, both here at the Beat Museum, just celebrating the inclusivity of of the beat religious journey. That was to be a uh, beat is to be a spiritual person. It was a spiritual pursuit. And it was not one of negation so much as affirmation. And maybe they were living in this world where things were being negated constantly. And so they were affirming life itself. And it was a very um, appetite, you know. And that's, I guess, where people get mis understand the beats is because they affirm their appetites they did not understand you know um you know that uh that that was religious but william blake a great uh, british poet said what the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom so add to this um neurodiversity now i, I love that term i only learned it uh, a, a couple of years ago um, and um, I am I am neurodiverse. I, I'm not telling you all that uh, that you all would, you know, uh, because I you know if I'm doing a bad bad job as your teacher, I I can blame it on my neurodiversity. I mean that might be a thing, but I'm doing it to 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 be seen and to say I see you. If you struggle with neurodiversity, this is the thing that we many of us uh, do struggle with. But the, the beatniks lived in this divine demonic madness matrix what I call systematically mad in a mad system, meaning they understood that society was crazy. And so maybe being crazy in a crazy society is the new sanity. I know I said that really fast. If the society itself is insane and what they're promoting as normalcy and conformity is insane, then my insanity is maybe a response to the insanity of the system and which would then make me truly sane. But I do have a diagnosis, ADHD, anxiety, and I am a, a recovered alcoholic. So there you go. Um, but we'll, we'll really explore uh, the this theme in the text themselves, and we'll read them from the text. We'll read Howell next week. On Wednesday, we'll make sure we read the passage in On the Road where Kerouac talks about the mad ones who are mad to live. It's such a beautiful uh, piece of Kerouacian uh, uh, prose. Um, definitely an idea that comes out of the beat. So madness is a big part of this journey is this respect for uh, the land and an understanding of the land. And definitely you're going to see ecology and anti-war sentiments coming out of the beat movement that will continue through the hippie movement. And this is one lineage uh, that t t exists till today. Peace and love, peace and love. Uh, and, you know, tree hugger stuff. I mean, you know, compost, your garden, organic. Uh, breathe clean air, stop polluting. Um, all of this stuff is, it, it, it's in the literature, it's in the movement of the 50s and 60s. And it was when they were building up this idea of a machine society that this this rebellion happened. We're going to learn about that, uh, you know, from um, Ginsburg, especially, I'm sorry, next week about this idea of the machine. Just a little snapshot of me exploring uh, some of the beat uh, places in the North Beach and City Lights Bookstore. Look how young I am in those pictures. I must must be. That's almost about six or eight years ago. In the Beat Museum, they actually have a Tennessee license plate that they had Kerouac on. I love that. Just love the Kerouac vanity plate, Tennessee van vanity plate um, of, of about 25 years ago. Um, a Kerouac conference from the early 80s with all these people there to talk about Kerouac. So here's my sister, Diane DePrima. We'll be talking about her uh, and, of course, Allen Ginsberg. Um, we'll be learning a little bit about Ann Waldman. Um, what, a, what a fun adventure uh, we're going to have. And so just uh, in the time that remains, just a quick um, introduction to the text of On the Road, uh, to the Cliff Notes version. Uh, and we're only reading an excerpt. I have gone in versions of this class and had you read uh, the entire novel, but this year we're using uh, the Beat Reader, and we will just uh, do a short excerpt of On the Road, which is a sign for you to read 
uh, this week. Um, so the character uh, uh, is Sal Paradise. Now there's versions of On the Road now where the, they don't have the pseudonyms. This, most of Kerouac's writings are completely autobiographical, and so this is just, you know, um, this is his life story, but he's he's loosely fictionalized it, I, I imagine, to protect the guilty uh, and to, uh, to avoid uh, any consequences, <laughs> if you will, for that. So uh, here we go. Uh, uh, Kerouac uh, is in this story as uh, as Sal Paradise. Uh, Ginsburg uh, is Carlo Marx. Um, uh, Tidell said about uh, Kerouac, America is his subject. Uh, he was born in 1922, died in 1969, age of 47. He's buried in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, yes, you can drink yourself to death. He had an internal hemorrhage, a bleeding, uh, internal bleeding. He was with his mother when he died in Florida and he just started puking blood and then that was it, it was over. Um, there's a short visit to his uh, gravestone on a very, very cold winter day uh, that we took uh, there. There's a great scene in uh, uh, one of the movies of Bob Dylan, who will be taking a brief look at Bob Dylan here in a few days as well in this unit, where Bob Dylan and Allen Ginsberg went to visit Kerouac's grave. And of course, the people who make offerings at Kerouac's grave, it's all booze all the little airline booze bottles you can see there um, at Kerouac's grave. There's a, have a Kerouac Park also uh, there in Lowell, Massachusetts, where there's these interesting, these kind of marble, uh, giant marble edifices with uh, poetry uh, inscribed upon it. Um, so, you know, uh, Kerouac was a football star. And, and, and this is so interesting, you know, I've noticed this over the years, you know, I, I don't know if anybody on the, on the call is involved in sports. I know that some of you are, some of you are student athletes for the university. I know I always have a handful of Golden Eagles with me. So, right. So, so they're growing up. I think there was this false dichotomy between, you know, the, the nerds and, and the jocks and definitely, you know, the beatniks and the hippies and the jocks, at least in most you know, typical high schools, they were on the opposite sides of the campus, you know, they were not, they were not commingling. And, uh, but still, um, this is, this is just a side note, but Kerouac was a football star. And, and I, I'll just never forget when a student wrote in, uh, in one of her discussions or blogs uh, years ago about um, the uh, text, uh, text of this class. Well, actually, I think maybe even about this very slide, maybe an earlier iteration of this slide was, I did not know that poets were good looking. I mean, that was basically what she wrote. And, and basically kind of the idea that you could be a football star and not ugly and be a poet was just like, you know, I mean, and, 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 and Kerouac and, and Cassidy, in contrast to Ginsburg, I mean, you know, and then you, you 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 find out you know that Ginsburg is gay, and he's chasing these guys around. He worships these two men, and of course, you know, it's not it's not mutually reciprocal in the same way. Well, that's a whole other story. I'm not going to get into too many of the details there, but there are details to get into at some point. Maybe we can go there um, later in the in the, in the unit. Um, but but clearly, uh, uh, these guys were of an icon icon iconic masculinity that is different. Than uh, than what you typically think of nerdy geeky poet types, uh, so Kerouac's energy and restlessness, uh, uh, abandoning uh, conscious control of his writing to go into an actual flow, getting rid of grammatical in inhibition. Remember, these people love uh, the run on on sentence. Uh, he writes very very fast. He writes honestly. He writes without shame. Uh, he has a range of styles that reflects the range of geographies. He wants to see all of, of North America. And we will call the Beats poets, but they also write novels. And even though Ginsburg is known more as a novelist, and I'm sorry, Ginsburg is known more as a poet, and Kerouac more as a novelist, I'm sorry, Kerouac novelist, Ginsburg poet, there is this blurring of uh, the genres as they're seeking after um, another kind of intelligence uh and 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 kerouac i'll have to address this a little bit more on uh wednesdays as we're running out of time but it's in your textbook kerouac, kerouac wrote this kind of you know list of uh demands upon himself for how to do his job scribbled secret notebooks and wild typewritten pages for your own joy submissive to everything open listening never get drunk outside your own house and be in love with your life so cars oh my gosh there's so many great 
things about the car in the first part of the section you're going to read for uh, the textbook for Wednesday is just all there's so much about the love of the road and the love of the car. It is really probably the most all American thing we're going to read all semester long. And it's and Kerouac is probably the most all American guy we're going to study all along. And the um, the passion for the automobile is really interesting as I'm rereading it uh, this weekend, how you know, Neil Cassidy kind of freaks Kerouac out. I mean, I mean, just read the story. We'll talk about it on Wednesday, but wow, 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 they are going fast. And so this is an incredible um, tangent. I wish I had more time uh, uh, to go on uh, this tangent with you this morning. But Kerouac, remember on a laptop, you can just type, 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 type. You don't have to stop. But these guys were using typewriters. And so you normal page, you know, normal eight by 11 page, you would type it, you'd have to change the page. And Kerouac wanted to write so fast, I mean, so fast that he got a scroll and he wrote on this scroll. And then the original scroll of On the Road is worth millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, was sold at auction several years ago for a very hefty sum. Uh, and then it has this idea of it being a sacred text because it's written on a darn scroll. It's just absolutely uh, incredible. And so there, there is this idea of speed and need. They're, they need to be on the road. They need to go fast. Um, they're, they're going fast. Uh, also, these guys are addicted also to amphetamines uh, as well as caffeine. Um, and then they have to fill all of these experiences. They want to have everything. They want to have God. They want to have women. They want to have drugs. They want to have the the whole of life, and they 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 kind of inhale life by uh, by fire hose. I mean, they they take in life in great gulps. They're very gluttonous and greedy in their human appetites, even though that they're they're basically broke, you know, impoverished writers. Um, I will refer back to this again a little bit, but really just mainly know that this book is about you know, real, actual people. Um, I made a slight allusion to the fact that uh, Ginsburg had crushes on on uh, Dean and, uh, well, Dean and Sal of Jack and Neil Cassidy, and then you bring in uh, Carolyn into the mix, and this was, uh, you know, a, a love triangle here uh, going on. Neil Cassidy is not really known as a beat writer, but as the kind of figure of the beat movement. Neil is what it's all about. Neil is the inspiration. He's the muse to both Kerouac and Ginsburg. Um, his wildness, uh, Neil Cassidy's wildness made the wildness of everyone else possible in, in the movement. He, he, he took it to the next level. And we'll see just a little bit of that in the selection that we're reading uh, for uh, this Wednesday. But this idea for um, Neil is that every experience was for its own sake. There's really no boundaries and there's no limits and there's really no reasons. I mean, it's kicks for kicks own sake. And, and this is, I think, this is the part that makes us so uncomfortable. We're so taught that everything has to have an objective, whether it's financial or academic, there's gotta be a purpose to everything, a purpose driven life. You know, I gotta go to college, I gotta get a job, I gotta get married, I gotta buy a house, I gotta, you know, get a, get a car, I gotta, you know, go on, you know, everything is so organized and regimented in society. This idea that you could live a life where you're just gonna be wild for wild sake. And it's hard to not, uh, condemn this, but in a sense, there were, were time periods in human history when when that's all that people did. People lived for the sake of life without these kind of ostensible exterior objectives being imposed um, upon them, living in the moment completely. So Neil Cassidy was a way of being that was both divine and demonic, glorious and desperate, uh, living in the now. Um, and we will leave that slide alone because I'm out of time. Um, but the last line, one of the last lines in the book, it's not in the excerpt we're reading, is, uh, is Sal Paradise, the narrator, Kerouac, thinking of, of Neil Cassidy. I think of Dean Moriarty. I think of Dean Moriarty. Oh, and God is Pooh Bear. Um, and I don't know why. I don't think, I'll, I'll need to double check, but I don't think uh, uh, the God is Pooh Bear section is in here. And I'm, I'm not sure why they left it out. Uh, I'll, I'll hopefully have time. Uh, to talk about that on, on Wednesday. So uh, we're going to have a regular meeting on Friday this week as well. So it's a full week, um, but we're going to be uh, looking into the section on, uh, on Kerouac 
on um, Monday, on, on this Wednesday, I'm sorry, the section that begins on, uh, on page like eight of your textbook. Um, and we'll be reading uh, from excerpts from On the Road together in class on Wednesday. And I'll probably um, lecture just a little bit more uh, on Kerouac at the start of it. Bring your questions. I'll open up a few uh, new uh, discussion threads. Um, and I've completely run out of time. So have a wonderful uh, Monday and we will see you on Wednesday.